It's Wednesday night, and we're in a study in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the story of literal Israel, a covenant that God made with a particular lineage, began with Adam. Adam was the progenitor. Progenitor means ancestry of, comes from pro and, and gene. He's the ancestor. Begin with Adam. And this ancestry, he had a son named Seth. Of course, he had a son named Abel. He had a son named Cain, but Cain killed Abel. And Seth takes the place of Abel. Cain is left out of the lineage of God. And Seth's lineage is Abel's lineage. And then he has a son named Enosh. And Enosh has a son named Canaan and Mahalalel. And these are all sons and grandsons. And then you get on down to Jared and, and uh, you get to Enoch and uh, Methuselah, uh, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. And then Noah's son Shem receives the blessing. And this is a covenant relationship with all these men. And every one of these men had many other children. All of them had lots and lots of children because they're all living over 960 years like Methuselah. Methuselah, 969. Jared, I believe, 962. Adam lived over 900. So they had lots and lots of children out here that were not in this covenant lineage. And God gives us this covenant. When he gets down here to Noah, he blesses Noah's son Shem, and he cancels out Japheth and cancels out Ham. And they had many, many sons. And Shem had a lineage that goes all the way down, uh, starting in Genesis, the 11th chapter, to Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. So the lineage that we see there in Genesis 5 and in Genesis 11, 5 and 11, is the lineage of Adam that takes us all the way to Israel. And then we've gone down through this in the book of Genesis. Genesis, And Jacob has 12 sons. They become the nation. Now I'm accused of repeating myself. If I don't reset where we were the week before, I would lose a lot of you. You wouldn't even know where we are. Now I know that uh, this man that wrote the letter, you just repeat yourself. Well, would you please send me a letter and explain the 70 weeks of Daniel and give me all the characters that I've gone through in the book of Genesis over the last three and a half years and tell me all the events, if you've got it down, you just write it all down and mail it to me, okay? I doubt seriously if you have any idea what I'm even talking about right now. Now, and of course, Israel has these sons and then Joseph ends up over in Egypt and then after he's, he's sold there by his brothers, and after he's in Egypt, he calls for his family to come over there. And they're over there 400 years. They're put into bondage for 400 years. And then they're liberated by a man named Moses. He comes along in Exodus, the second chapter. And in the 12th chapter, he leads them out of Egypt at the last Passover, the 10th plague. The 10th plague. Now, I put this on the board like it's second nature, and it is. I want it to become second nature to you. So you can just sit down and write it out. And if I'll say this enough times, maybe you'll get to where you can do this. Now, I've spent 50, going on 59 years studying the Bible. If you think I repeat myself to you, you ought to see how much I repeat myself to myself. Because when you read these prophets, they're all saying the same thing over and over and over. Israel, don't go after these gods. Israel, don't go after these gods. God's going to bring judgment. He's going to bring the sword, the famine. He's going to bring the sword, the famine, the pestilence. Israel, don't go after these gods. He's going to bring the beast. He's going to bring Babylon. Then he's going to bring uh, Persia. He's going to bring Greece. He's going to bring Rome in to put you in captivity. And that's what the whole Bible's about. It's not like you get all this down all at once, you don't. Well, <laughs> we've worked our way over to the 25th chapter. They leave Egypt in the 12th chapter that next morning. In the 14th chapter, they cross the Red Sea and all of Pharaoh's armies are drowned. 
the, 20, the 20th chapter is where they get the Ten Commandments. They get to the mountain of God in the 18th chapter, the 19th chapter. Moses goes up on the mountain, comes down in the 20th chapter. Can you, can you get just that? Can you just get this? They get to the mount of God in the 18th chapter. Moses goes up on the mountain in the 19th chapter. He comes down from the mountain in the 20th chapter with the Ten Commandments. The two plates of God in his hand. Can you get that part down? If somebody says, Ten Commandments, where is that in the Bible? You should know it's in the 20th chapter by now. Right? I hope so. Then we get over to the 25th chapter. And God begins to speak to Moses about making the building a place of worship. And he starts in that 25th, 26th chapter. And I'm not going to go through all the details of it. I've looked at this and say, Lord, how can I teach him all the details? I'll teach you some of the details of the law. But when we get into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it's going to get pretty complex. What I'm going to do, I've been thinking about this. I'm going to show you the shadows over here. The shadows, excuse me, shadows of the Old Testament and how they align with the New Testament. Shadows. And how it aligns with New Testament. Now we've gotten to some parts of that. We know that the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled. We know our hearts are sprinkled. Now, uh, we know that inside the Ark of the Covenant was the law written on tables of stone. The law written, let me say this and see if I can get you to understand this. The law written on tables of stone is the same thing as the law written upon fleshy tables of our hearts, isn't it? Fleshy tables of our hearts. And if that's true, this would be the seal of God upon our hearts, wouldn't it? What if I said this would be the mark upon our hearts, upon hearts? Now we see in the book of Revelation, we've been talking about this, we see in the book of Revelation, we see the word mark, the mark of the beast, and we see the seal that God puts that God puts upon, God puts in the forehead and uh, on the hand. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean there's a literal seal put upon us? This, if our hearts are sprinkled, I don't know if I need to jump there. If our hearts are sprinkled, let me just, light, let me align some things for you. This word mark is the word karagma. Now, if you, if you heard me say this before, don't think I'm going to say it one time. You've got mark all through the book of Revelation. You've got seal all through the book of Revelation. This word, this word mark is the word karagma. It means an etching. Or a stamp. Now this is not something that begins in Revelation. It comes from the word character. C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-R. It's our word character. I've said this many times. Your reputation is what people think you are. Your character is what you are. <coughs> and we get the word, that comes from the word karax. Karax means a stake on a boundary. 
Now, we said that that stake began in the garden. The Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law. That's in 1 John 3, in 3, 3 and 4, I believe it is. Transgression of the law. Let me show you how this word here, look at that, look. Look at 1 John. I'm going to show you how that aligns with the Garden of Eden. 1 John 3. 1 John 3. And look here in verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. I'm going to show you how this is related to Mark. Sin is the transgression. Sin is the word H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. Hamartia. Of course, there's no H's in the Greek. There's the diacritical mark, the H sound, the breathing sound, hamartia. Now, hamartia means to miss the mark. What if I said to miss the stake on the boundary line? Miss the stake? Well, the word law is the word nomos. That is the Greek word, law, and it means legal food. Now, transgression in that verse is the word A-N-O-M-I-A, -A, anomia. Anomia is a construction of the word nomos. And when you place the alpha in front of nomos, as a negative particle, it negates the word nomos, and it means unlawful food. This is prescribed, nomos means prescribed food for, for animals, and we are sheep. In our case, we're sheep. So that means prescribed food for sheep, placing the alpha, sin, missing the mark, is anomia, is unlawful food. When we're supposed to be doing the law of God, then you miss the mark. Well, what happened in the garden? Well, you had a tree in the midst of the garden, a tree in the midst of the garden, make it a Christmas tree because that's what it was, and you had a tree. When you go beyond the border, Behind God's border, the legal food is these trees out here, aren't they? God says you can eat of all the trees of the garden, but of the tree in the midst of the garden thou shalt not eat. This would be unlawful food, wouldn't it? That would be transgressing the boundary of God and going to that tree that was unlawful. So sin is unlawful food. It's anomia. It's transgressing the law of God. So the law says you can eat of these trees out here, but you cannot eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. So when you go beyond the mark, mark, beyond the stake, beyond the karagma, it's the same thing as the word mark over there in the Old Testament. You're going to the mark of the beast, and I said it last week, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The serpent was ruling in the garden. If there had been a man that God could have entered to seduce Adam and Eve, but there was no other man, so he used a serpent. And he seduces Adam and Eve, or he seduces Eve. Adam was not seduced. Eve was. That's what the Scripture tells us. That she was seduced to go beyond the mark and to go to the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast was here in the garden. If you have God's seal in your forehead. The word seal is the word sphragis, S-P-H-R-A-G-I-S. That is the noun. And the verb is sphragizo, S-P-H-R-A-G-I-Z-O. It means 
signature. And a, and a seal, a seal, a legal seal, they didn't have books like we have. They had scrolls rolled up. They had scrolls. And then they would take, and they had a, a ring on their finger that they would dip in clay or they'd dip it in hot wax and they would seal it shut and it was against the law. If you opened a sealed uh, book, which was a scroll, especially a Roman scroll, if you opened a Roman seal, the penalty was death. And they were looking for someone to open that seven sealed book that Jesus had in his right hand in the fifth chapter of Revelation. And he only was worthy to open up those seals to show who had the signature of God upon their foreheads. And to have a signature upon your forehead didn't mean to stamp it literally on your head. They would do that in the ancient world under the shadows. They would do that under the shadows. They would actually put a stamp on a man's forehead or they would bore his his ear through with an awl, an A-U-L. They would put him upside the door. And they would drive, just like you're punching a hole in, in a woman's ear to put an earring in it. They would put him up on the door. If he was a slave and he had served seven years, and he says, I don't want to go out of this household. I want to be a permanent slave in this man's house. That's what you wanted to be in Israel. If you were a poor person in Israel, you wanted to be a slave in a rich man's household because they would adopt you as a part of the family and treat you like a king as a slave in the household. You would do your work, but you'd have a part of the inheritance. You'd be like a son in the house. Being a slave in Israel is not like being a slave in early America. It was like being a part of the family. You were given an inheritance. You were given a place to live. You were given whatever. So if you could go into a household of a of a householder that had lots of money, that, was the, that would be preferable than having your own little spread out here somewhere with a little bitty hut. It was preferable that you could go in with a very rich householder and be a part of his family. Now, where were we? We're talking about this mark, this mark, and it all comes back to this right here. When God writes upon fleshy tables of our hearts, if our hearts are sprinkled like the Ark of the Covenant, and the law is written on tables of stone, kept inside the Ark of the Covenant, and God's written upon fleshy tables of our heart, then that, that writing would be the seal of God upon the hearts. That would be having God's mark on our lives. The mark of the beast is not something that you get during the tribulation period. That's something that God puts in the minds of the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. They don't have in their hearts the law written. They had not given an ear to hear. You don't get the seal of God during the great tribulation period. I mean, you hear people say, well, if you take the mark of the beast, that means you have to go to hell. Well, yeah, you've served God all your life for 50 years. Here I have been preaching for all my life, and all of a sudden the tribulation comes on, and, they, and the world beast says, let's go get Jim Brown and put a seal on his forehead and put it on his hand. Aha, now you have to go to hell, Jim Brown. <laughs> that's not what that's about. It's about putting it in the mind. It's just like Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Take my law, put it before your eyes. It doesn't mean to stick a black box like the phylactery of the Pharisees. And it doesn't mean to put a, to put a computer chip. It doesn't even mean to use your DNA. It means it's been put into your mind. If our hearts of the Ark of the Covenant and the instruction of God was put inside that Ark of the Covenant, then that Ark of the Covenant is our heart, and the heart was the place of understanding, wasn't it? Look, when you find this seal of God upon His people, and this takes us back to that ninth chapter of Ezekiel, I'm not going to work my way over there as I have done. If you want to see the rest of this series, uh, take the last eight, nine weeks and watch them on Wednesday night. Don't have time to go through this over and over. Now, look over here. This would be the seal of God 
And notice who puts the seal there. Go to 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. 2 Corinthians, third chapter. <clears throat> so when we get to that sragis, the signature of God, God seals His people, doesn't He? He certainly does. And I'll look at some of those verses. All right. Second, where did I say it was going? Oh, Second Corinthians, third chapter. If our hearts are sprinkled, well, let me, let me go ahead and give you that before we do this. Let's see that our hearts are sprinkled. Look over here in, back to Hebrews. I like to tie all this together. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. <clears throat> Verse 22, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water or living water. And living water is the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Living water is the Word of God. Now, Look over here and go. Back. And Jesus tells the woman to the well, I'll give you living water and you'll never thirst again. Living water was what they call rushing water in those undermountain streams or in these rivers that were flowing in the mountains. That was called living water. And that's why the woman said, you don't have anything to draw with. The well is very deep here at Jacob's well. Jesus said, I'll give you living water that you'll never thirst again. Now look back over here. Our hearts are sprinkled. Look at Second Peter, I mean First Peter 1. One. I like to tie these verses all together. One and verse two. Elect. Favored. Eclectos. E K L E K T O S. According to the foreknowledge of God. Prognosis. Prognosis. Uh, the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. And here's what we're elected unto: unto obedience. And the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So our hearts are sprinkled and we're elected to the sprinkling of blood. Now where is that blood sprinkled? Go to Revelation the first chapter. Revelation 1. Revelation first chapter. Verse 5. Last sentence of the verse. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. There's the sprinkling of blood there, isn't it? That'd be the same thing as 2 Peter 1 and 2. That'd be the same thing as, as Hebrews 10, 22. Now go back over here to, to 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. 2 Corinthians, third chapter. Look at verse 2. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts known and read of men. We don't have to, of all men, we don't have to commend ourselves. What you do is being read by people. People say, I don't have to quit cussing. I don't have to quit drinking. You are being read by men. You are epistle of Christ. And you are a letter written to the world by your actions. Yes, it does matter how you talk and how you walk and how you... And what you do matters. It, whatsoever we do in order to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, do all to the glory of God, do it with all of our might. And we do everything to glorify God. We're to abstain from all appearances of evil and cussing and drinking and smoking and all of this is appearance of evil, isn't it? It doesn't matter what cuss words like some guy wrote. Well, maybe cuss words in the ancient world were different than today. It doesn't matter. Whatever looks bad in our society, you don't need to be doing it. Do we? No. Drinking, cussing, sleeping around. You're not supposed to be doing that. Do you know that people do that so easily? For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone any longer, where that Ark of the Covenant sprinkle, not that, but in fleshy tables of our hearts, and our hearts are sprinkled. Our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. What happened to all this over here? Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the handwriting of it, rituals. All the rituals are blotted out, and it all became spiritual. 
I've said that hundreds of times. I hope you get to where you can explain it to somebody. A lot of times if I'm explaining some, something to somebody and I'm in a restaurant, I say, you got a piece of paper. Let me show you something real quick. And I'll just draw them a, draw them a little temple. And I'll put the Ark of the Covenant there and I'll put the candlesticks. I'll say, now here's this and here's, here's the brazen sea and here's, the, here's this. And, and I'll sit there and explain it to them on a piece of paper. I want you to get to where you can do that. You say, what do I say to people in public? Say everything you've learned. Say what you can. You say, I can understand it when you say it, Jim. I just can't say it. Well, let me say it some more until you get to where you can say it, okay? I want you to be able to repeat it. I don't care if you say it verbatim exactly the same way I'm saying it. It's the truth. And as you learn more, you can add more to it. So he says, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Therefore, it makes our hearts the Ark of the Covenant, doesn't it? Isn't that what he's saying? Now it's no longer in tables of stone, but in your heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who hath made us able ministers of the new last will and testament, the new D-I-A-T-H-E-K-E, D-I-A-T-H-E-K-E, D-I-E, D-I-A-T-H-E-K-E. That's the word, D-I-A-T-H-E-K-E is the word testament, means last will and testament. Not of the letter which was on tables of stone, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth. What is that talking about? The literal law over here will kill you. But the spiritual law, which is written in our hearts, will give us life. That's what he's talking about. But the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, what did he just get through saying in verse 6? The letter killeth. This is what it's talking about. But if the ministration diakonia, the deacon, the waiter of the law, D-I-A, K-O-N-I-A. It's our word deacon. That's a servant. That's a servant, a waiter of tables. One who waits upon the law, waiter of tables. One who services this law, in this literal temple, this administers death. That's what it does. Everything that was going over here, over here, was a picture of Christ who was to come. If the ministration of death, which is the law, the Old Testament rituals, written and engraven in stones, which was inside the Ark of the Covenant, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, that's under the new covenant. How shall not the ministering of the Spirit be rather more glorious than the old? That's what he's saying. And that's what we are under this new. And I'm not going to keep reading there. I'm just trying to point out to you that Everywhere, now let's go back over here to Hebrews, the 8th chapter. We're talking about the seal of God, the seal of God, or the mark. And I don't know how to explain this other than just to, you know how much there is to the Bible. There's millions of characters and events in the Bible. When you break every little thing down, I've spent a lifetime studying this. And I'm just beginning to get a view of the overall picture. And I'm trying to impart it to you. When I die, I want you to be strong. I want you to be strong in these facts. I've said this so many times. If you give me a choice of whether I can read an encyclopedia or a book on inspiration, I'll take the encyclopedia every time. This will give me facts. I would rather get my inspiration from the Bible. I want the facts about something. Give me a book on information. That's why I like men like Alfred Edersheim. The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Here's the sketches of the Jewish social life. 
I love these kind of books. It'll give me information, not inspiration. I, I have nothing against the Reformers, nothing against Puritans. They all, a lot of them had different beliefs. But if I'm going to read something, give me the facts of something. Break down some words for me. I want to know the Greek and the Hebrew and the history and the culture and the customs and what something meant. I want to know that rather than rather than uh, just another view, another man's view of predestination. I've studied predestination from every angle you could possibly study it from. We've got 20 years of messages, on, at least one message a week on it, and some of the, a lot of the other messages are tied all together in God's great sovereignty, so all everything we teach is about the sovereignty of God. Everything. All of the 70 weeks of Daniel couldn't have happened unless God arranged it, could it? All the evil that God arranged couldn't have happened. Israel wouldn't be alive today in Israel, literal Israel, without God having preserved them over thousands of years. Like Mr. Max I. DeMont said, he said they are known in greater proportion to their... To their, uh, I've got a book up here, maybe it's up here. He said, they're known of in greater proportion than the ratio that they have, that they are in relationship to the other nations of the world. They are a fraction of 1% of the world's population. A very, I don't know what the, what the percentage would be, but it would be just a, maybe a thousandth of one percent of the world's population. And they're known of in physics and chemistry far above uh, all the other Gentile nations that's out here in the world. It, you cannot discount the fact that God has preserved them over thousands of years. They were trampled under feet by the Babylonians, by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, by the Persians, by these empires where their armies were magnificent throughout the world. They were just crushed underfoot, yet they're alive and well. And those armies of Rome, of Greeks, of Persia, of Babylon, they're just a bunch of molding uh, bodies in the dust somewhere out there, just rotting old dead skeletons out there. And Israel is still here. It's an astounding thing that God has done and God's Israel is truly spiritual now where was I here in Hebrews 8 we're talking about this mark that God puts on his people Hebrews the 8th chapter and you ought to write these down and keep them all together Hebrews the 8th chapter here in verse 10 this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, and now it's spiritual, it's the church. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. Now he's, what did he say over there in, in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians? No longer in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Our heart is sprinkled there. In Hebrews 10, 22, we're elected unto obedience in the sprinkling of blood. That's our hearts. And then in Revelation 1 and 5, he's washed us from our sins in his own blood. That washing is putting it in our hearts, isn't it? Now look at Romans 5. Everywhere you find, it's not saying it the same way. It's saying our hearts are sprinkled. We're elected unto obedience in the sprinkling of blood. Written in flesh of tables of the heart, no longer in tables of stone. That makes our hearts the Ark of the Covenant. Like I say, uh, Indiana Jones can quit looking for the Ark of the Covenant. It's our hearts, isn't it? That's what it is. I mean, they're wasting their time. If they found it, what are they going to do with it? It's not going to kill anybody anymore, is it? No. It's worth nothing. Oh, it may be worth something to some great archaeologist as an artifact, but it's not worth anything spiritually at all. Because God's blotted that out, hasn't He? 
Right at the rituals. Now, where did I say we was going? Romans 5. Romans 5. All right. Romans comes after Acts. So all these, this is all the mark of God or the seal of God upon his people. Now, fifth chapter. Therefore, being justified by faith, we're justified by works. We're justified by faith that works, aren't we? In James, the second chapter. Wilt thou know, vain man, that faith for that works is dead, being alone? We are saved by a working faith because the works is agape, isn't it? Get all of this together. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When you begin to not work for salvation, we're, by the grace you say through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus into good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Good works, the good works of God that's in us. It's God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. We have to, if we believe God, believing is obedience, isn't it? If you believe something, you do it. I keep saying, does everybody here believe two times two equals four and 2 times 3 equals 6, and 2 times 4 equals 8. Do you believe your multiplication tables? Does anybody believe in multiplication tables? Or do you decide when you're balancing your checkbook, I don't think I'll subtract that much from my balance so I'll have more money in the bank? Is that what you do? If you believe your multiplication tables and you got, if you got $98, in the bank, $98.25, and you spend $60, you say, let me see, no, wait a minute, eight, three, no, wait a minute, I don't like that, I don't like that, I spent $60, but I'm only going to subtract 40, I want to have $58.25, okay, is that what you do, do you do that? No, no, if you believe, add and subtract, and you believe in multiplication tables, if you believe it, you do it. Don't you? You don't believe something and not do it. Let me tell you something. This is a secret. Don't tell nobody. What people believe is what they do, and what they do is what they believe. Not what they say. The Pharisees would say and do not, Jesus said. Don't say and do not. You have to be doing to believe it. And that's everybody. I found that out. And when I was in real estate, somebody would say, if you don't buy me a refrigerator, I'm not going to buy the house. I'd say, don't buy it. I don't care, don't buy it. And they'd say, well, we'll go ahead and buy it, but you should buy us a refrigerator. Well, I'm not going to do that. If you want the house, you buy it, okay? I learned that people will do what they want to do and they'll threaten you and they'll still do what they want to do. Did you know that? Even through threats. I've had people threaten me all my life. I say, well, then don't do it. I don't care if you do it because I know they're going to do what they want to do. Have you figured that out yet? You don't have to fight somebody. They're going to do what they want. And you can't talk them out of it. I've learned to leave people alone in their want-tos. If God doesn't change their want-to, I'm not going to try to. Now, where was I? Romans. Romans. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. You want to learn how to be patient? I'm, I'm just very impatient. Well, you need more trials. Okay? God needs to put you through more fire. And that way you'll be patient and you'll learn to just accept things the way they are. word patient is hupomeno. Or hupomone. Hupomone. 
And the noun form is hupo meno. That's the noun. This is the verb. This is patience. Excuse me, patience is the noun. This is the noun. And this is the verb. Hupomeno is the word endure. They didn't endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, who's going to endure? Well, those that God chooses. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Those that he chooses to endure will endure. Then he says, Tribulation, work with patience. In patience, experience. Experience is not really a good translation. It's the word dokime, D-O-K-I-M-E. D-O-K-I-M-E, dokime. Remember, dokimazo means to try or put in the fire or test. Test. And placing the alpha in front of dokime translates cast away. Cast away or reprobate. Paul calls it cast away. He said, if I do not bring my body in subjection to live the way I'm supposed to, I'll be a castaway, I'll be a reprobate. Reprobate means no fire. I don't like fiery trials, so I'm going to live the way I want without living righteously for God, without crucifying myself. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. Elpizo, or Elpis, E-L-P-I-S, expectation of the promises God has made and some of those expectations we have are tribulation and fire and trial. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Notice what's shed abroad in our hearts. Agape. All of this is the seal of God. This is the signature of God when he writes upon fleshy tables of our hearts. And agape is love, and the Bible says, is that word love, Second John 6, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. So God writes his commandments in our hearts. That's the same thing when he says this here, I've said this before, and nobody's ever commented to me about it. If the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, defining the word love, 2 John 6, is walking in the commandments of God, then the commandments of God is shed abroad. Shed abroad is the word ekeo, E-K-C-H-E-O. means to gush out. That's the same thing that God's going to pour out of His Spirit Pour out is this word at kale on all flesh. It doesn't mean every individual. It means red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh. He said, and of course the Jews had a word, synecdoche, S-Y-N-E-C-H-D-O-C-H-E. It meant a part of something was the whole. The Gentiles had been forbidden from having the truth over here in the Old Testament that's why they were the spirits in prison, fulake, the division of day and night or light and darkness. And they were kept in darkness until, the, until Acts, the second chapter, and God poured out of His Spirit on all flesh. And that's the same thing that He's saying here. His Spirit is the truth. And that word pour out over there in Acts, the second chapter, is the same word as shed abroad right here at Kao. E-K-C-H-U, it means to gush out. The same word. This is, look at that in Acts 2. Look at this in Acts 2. This is the birth of the New Testament church in Acts 2. And Peter stood up. In verse 16, Acts 2. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. Well, if this is that that Joel would say would happen in the last days, then the last days are here in Acts 2, aren't they? If I said, Jim Brown's preaching on the platform here in this day. Well, that means I'm up here preaching right now. If Peter says, I'm giving you what Joel, the second chapter says, that in the last days the Lord will pour out of His Spirit on all flesh, 
Pour out is the same word, ekeo. And what's the Holy Spirit? Truth. John 14, 15, 16, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, 1 John 5 and 6. The Spirit is the truth. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. So this pouring out right here is God's seal being put upon these people and it's going to be put upon all the Gentile elect for the next 2,000 years. And that will be the God sealing His people. You see that? I hope... Are you getting this? Tie together every one of these verses. If He sheds abroad His agape, which is walking in His commandments, in our hearts, and He writes upon fleshy tables of our hearts, and our hearts are sprinkled, and we're, He's washed us from our sins in His own blood, that's all our hearts. And the heart was the place of understanding, wasn't it? And there is none that understandeth, and none seeks after God. How do we understand? Notice, who does the writing upon our hearts? Do we do it by accepting Christ? No. Uh, who sprinkles? Where does the action proceed from when our hearts are sprinkled? Does it come from our hearts? Does our heart have to accept it? No. Will our heart receive it? Certainly it will. But it'll be by the will of God when He overthrows our understanding. So every one of these verses, He's going to write His covenant upon our hearts there in the 8th chapter of Hebrews. The 10th chapter of Hebrews, He's going to write it upon our hearts. Well, I didn't give you that one in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. They all go together. 10th chapter of Hebrews. I gave you part of the 10th chapter, but not all the rest of it. And He shows... By these verses, and I'm sure this fellow already understands all these that said you repeat yourself. I'm sure you can quote all this to us and explain it to us without going over it another time, can't you? Notice how many times God repeats himself over and over and over and over. Have you ever told your kid, don't do that? I told you not to do that. Quit doing that. I'm going to spank you if you keep doing that. That's the last straw. That's it. What do you think God was doing all through Ezekiel, all through Jeremiah? While Ezekiel's over here in Babylon preaching to the captives over there, Jeremiah's over here in Israel preaching to the people that are going to be carried captive, and they're not listening and paying any attention. He says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Here comes judgment. I told you quit doing that. You don't like me repeating. Read Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I couldn't read through Ezekiel just straight through it without somebody saying, you're repeating yourself. Well, certainly I am. The Bible's repeating it over and over and over. When God says, written on fleshy tables of the heart, the agape shed abroad in our hearts. Written up, I'll, my covenant I'll write in their hearts. It's all the same action, just different words, different ways of saying it. Can you see that? Somebody say yes or no. Can you see that? Whenever I say that, I know this is a lot of stuff. I want you to see it. Now go back over here to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Hebrews 10. And he says the same thing here. And it's spoken of throughout the Scriptures. You have to learn to look for it under different wording synonymous phrases. Now he says here in verse 16 of chapter 10, This is the covenant that I will make with them, or with his spiritual Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts. You notice, he said, I'm going to shed abroad my love in their hearts. And love is agape, walking in the commandments of God. I'm going to sprinkle their hearts. It's all the same action from different writers, different expressive ways of saying it. Can you see that? I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And it will come out in their actions and in their words. 
You can't go to heaven without the Word of God written in your heart. You know this connects with the daily cross. Because when it's in, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in a man's heart comes out of his mouth. I don't know what my... I've had people... I had a guy call me the other day and he said, I said, did your preacher preach predestinate? I said, your preacher is lying to you. He said, how do you know? You're very presumptuous. I said, if there's anybody in Nashville preaching these truths, I'd know about it. Well, you don't know. I said, does your preacher preach predestination? Well, I don't know. I said, you would know if he preached it because he'd be saying it every service. I said, he doesn't if you've never heard him say it. And if a man's, if it's in a person's heart, it's going to come out of his mouth. And if it comes out of his mouth, that's connected with confessing, isn't it? Confession is homologeo. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Homo of the same logos word. Means to agree with. If you tell people Christmas is pagan, Easter's pagan, God doesn't love everybody. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. You tell them God's got vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. They're going to want to crucify you because that's coming out of your heart. And it was written in your heart. You can't keep it in your heart. What's in the heart comes out of the mouth. You can tell if somebody believes God. Watch their life. If you don't know anything about a daily cross, self-denial, you're not a believer. I was watching those gospel singers. I knew a bunch of them back when I was in gospel music the other night, and they're just singing about a nice, sweet, pretty Jesus that loves everybody with a bunch of high notes and low notes. I'm just sitting there going, if they would let me on Bill Gaither's program and start preaching these truths and give me a chalkboard, all those people's countenance would drop. There'd be no smiles. They'd be going, oh, Jim Brown's at it again. They would all droop. The Jesus they sing about is the wrong Jesus. No daily cross, no self-denial, no daily dying, no eternal life. Jim, you're awful hard. They want to joke and laugh and smile all the time and clap. I'm the most serious man you'll ever be around. Life is serious. Do you know that serious is enjoyable to me? I enjoy serious. You know why? I don't have to play games with nobody and I don't have to be fooled by anybody and I can get, get blunt with somebody and say that's the way it is. And they don't like that. But they haven't learned that serious is not a game. I love serious. I'm serious all the time. I'll joke once in a while but I get back to truth real quick. Do you know that's comforting? Truth comforts me. It's in my heart. It's going to come out of my mouth. I was considered a renegade when I was in gospel music. They, we had one of the best singing groups out there. But the word was out, don't let Jim Brown on the big concerts because if you do, he'll say stuff from the stage. And I did. And I'll say stuff to them now. They don't want to hear it. See some of them in town once in a while. I start to get serious and I think, they don't want to hear it. I could tell you long stories about it. Two of the big super gospel singers that control gospel music sent my little brother to me one time and told him, tell your brother to get out of the gospel field. We're not letting him in. You see, there was a big circuit all over America for the big super concerts. And they told Dean, they said, you tell him he's not coming in to the big concerts. We're not letting him in. Because of what came out of my mouth. It was in my heart. It's still there. They know it. You could ask them, remember Jim Brown? Oh, yeah, we all remember him. He kept condemning us all because we were sleeping around with all kinds of women and drinking and cussing. And after all, we're gospel singers. That's what gospel singers do. One of the famous gospel piano players, his name was Joe Mascale. 
he played piano for the Imperials in Vegas when they were with Elvis. And I was on a bus one time. He was playing for the Prophets. This is about 1964, and I was with the Young Blackwoods, and I thought I'd ride on the bus to the next stop with the Prophets. And Joe was sitting up front, real good-looking guy. Boy, he had women after him like crazy. And he turned around on the bus and looked back at me and said, Jimmy, what are you doing out here on the road with us gospel singers? You seem like a good Christian boy. I'll never forget his words. Joe, you said that to me. If he's watching. Even gospel singers know that they're heathens. How did I get on to that? I don't know. Oh, it's not written in their hearts. They don't go out there singing about the... I challenge one of you songwriters... Write some songs about whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Write a song about he hath chosen us him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us in the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counts of his own will. Write a song about, unless you carry your cross daily, you can't be my disciple and go to heaven when you die. Write a song about, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Without it, you can't go. Okay? I never heard gospel songs like that, have you? Never heard one. Now, we do have a hymn that's my favorite hymn. The church is one foundation. It's predestination all the way through. For it takes one holy food, one holy nomos. Elect from every nation, yet one or all the earth. Now, that's predestination, isn't it? You read the words of that song, that's the most predestination song that's ever been written that I know of. One Lord, one faith. It's magnificent song about God's elect family. Write that, one of you songwriters. Nobody will, if you write Romans 8, 29 in a song, don't expect to sell any records, right? They ain't going to buy that. Don't go to land. Yeah, Bill Gaither won't let you sing it on his program, that's for sure. So he says here, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds while I write them, and their sins and their iniquities while I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having no for brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus now, and our hearts are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. That's when he writes upon our hearts. That's when he, that's when the, Seal of God is put upon us by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, His flesh is the veil now, and His flesh is the bread, and His bread is the body, and the body is the church. And inside that holy of holies is the house of God in Christ as the son of His own house, whose house are we. Having a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek over this house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with living water pure water cold water remember that give a cup of cold water and that was the living water under the ground and that's equated with the cold water the Holy Spirit that quenches our spiritual thirst now We've tied together that. Let's go back over here to, to Ezekiel. We worked our way up in Ezekiel to this ninth chapter. Now, when you're reading the book of Ezekiel, it's the same thing. If you don't have the McClinic and Strong Encyclopedia, I suggest if you can't get that, get the five-volume set of 
Zondervan's Pictorial Dictionary. And any time you're going to read one of these prophets, first of all, open up the encyclopedia to the book of Ezekiel. Read what it has to say about Ezekiel. Read what it has to say about the book of Ezekiel. It'll have Ezekiel, then it'll have the book of Ezekiel. It'll have Ezekiel, the book, or it'll have Ezekiel. Read what it says about that prophet. If you're going to read Jeremiah, read what it has to say about Jeremiah. If you're going to read Isaiah, read what it has to say. And then start reading Jeremiah or read Isaiah. I have worked on these books for decade after decade so I can get a general idea of what these guys are doing. Do you know I've never heard anybody preach on the book of Isaiah? Never heard anybody preach on the book of Jeremiah? Never heard anybody preach on the book of Ezekiel? I've heard them get dabs and smidgen out of it, but I haven't heard them preach on the book and what it's about. I have absolutely never heard a man mention the book of Hosea. And I preached through the whole book. Hosea is, you'll notice when these guys were born. When you notice when they were born, and some of them is approximate. They're not really sure when Joel was born. But Joel, sometimes they put him up at the front of Israel. Some of the writers, they're not real sure. Some put him back up here and some put him down here. They're not sure about Joel. Here they've got him up here. Some say he comes before that. just depends on which writer you're reading after. Well, if you notice, if he is in 835, it says 835, right? And if Obadiah is in 845, remember. Remember when northern Israel was carried away into captivity. Northern Israel carried away in 722 B.C. If a prophet is living before 720, even though this is southern Judah, they're prophesying concerning Israel's apostasy. Notice when these guys are being born, when they're being born, and they're going to be preaching not only to northern Israel, but to southern Judah for their apostasy of bringing down of Jeroboam, of J, excuse me, uh, Ahab marrying Jezebel, bringing these gods down into Israel and bleeding down into southern Judah. If you'll notice, most of the prophets, Isaiah is preaching in 739. They've got him preaching in 739, even though he preached for many years. Micah is preaching in 737. So Isaiah, in all probability, not in all probability, but it's a fact, he's preaching to northern Israel for their apostasy. He's preaching before northern Israel falls in 722, isn't he? Micah's preaching before they fall in 737, approximately. When you get down here in 650, Nahum's preaching after northern Israel has fallen, isn't he? Therefore, he must be preaching, he must be preaching to this surviving southern Judah, isn't he? He mentions that he is the burden of Nineveh, but he's not just preaching to Nineveh. If you'll notice, if you go through these guys' books, they'll start off preaching to one empire, and then they'll start preaching to another empire, then they'll work their way down to northern Israel, then to southern Judah, and to the people that have corrupted them. Look at the dates when they're preaching. Daniel and Ezekiel are over in Babylon. Habakkuk's preaching over here in, in Judah. He's preaching a long time. Some say he preached before this 609. You have to read and dig out what these different writers say. You'll have dates in, if you have a uh, Thompson Chain Bible, you'll have dates that even differ, will differ with what they say in here. These are approximate dates. And some of the historians don't think you can read one historian and get all the answers. You can. This is a very reliable set of books, the McClinic and Strong. If you can get a set of these, get a set of them, and when you're going to read about one of these prophets, read his life first, read something about his life, then read about the book, and then go in and read the book. Does that sound very elementary? Huh? That's all you have to do. 
And if you do it enough, you'll start seeing the story. Now, let's get back over here to... How much time do I have, Mike? Let's go back over here to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. Now, what's happening in Ezekiel, the ninth chapter? I know this guy thinks he's already got it all down. But there's a man here with an ink horn. And this man is commanded by God to go throughout the city and mark those. This is the seal of God. God has written upon fleshy tables of their hearts. Do you think fleshy tables of the heart only applies in the New Testament? No. God is, do you think that God had written His Word on Moses' heart? Do you think He written His Word on Abraham's heart? How about Jeremiah's heart? How about Isaiah's heart? We well, yeah, had. I can't hear. Uh, has he? Well, if he has, then the heart doesn't just apply to the New Testament, does it? In fact, if you take McClinic and Strong or the five-volume set, look up heart of the uh, Zondervan's Pictorial Dictionary, excellent set of encyclopedias. They're more modern. They don't have a lot of the stuff that the old McClinic and Strong has in it, but they'll have a lot of modern stuff in it. And you look at the word heart in an encyclopedia, it will tell you that was what they said was the seed of their understanding. So when the Bible says, if thou confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart, it don't believe in, mean believe in your aorta and your right ventricle and left ventricle and your bicuspid valve and your tricuspid valve. That's not where it's talking about believing. Believe in your understanding. But since none understands and none seeks after God, God has to give you a new heart. He says that in the 36th chapter of Ezekiel. I'm going to take away your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. Oh, well, blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Well, where in the world are you going to get a pure heart? It has to come from God, doesn't it? In fact, we're here in Ezekiel. Look at that 36th chapter. Look at the 36th chapter. All through this book, he's talking about Israel falling and then coming back. The book talks about the first part of the book. Up through the 20-something chapter, he's talking about Israel being brought down because of their apostasy. And in the 36th chapter, he's talking about bringing them back and giving them a new heart. In this 36th chapter, everywhere, I think I've hit just about everywhere in it, where it says, I will, I underlined it in red, I highlighted it in yellow. I will, and he, this is where he says, speak to the mountains of Israel. Well, Ezekiel, the mountains of Israel is Moriah, Zion. Zion it was a term for all of Israel. Zion was a place where Jerusalem sat, and Moriah was where the temple sat. And Moriah is the same mountain where Abraham was told to go and offer Isaac before Israel was called Israel. That's amazing, isn't it? <coughs> It's the same place where David offered sacrifice and Arana gave David his threshing floor. He sold David his threshing floor there in the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel so David could offer sacrifice to God. He said, I'll not offer sacrifice of that which doth cost me nothing. It costs me to serve God. I'm not going to take from God and not support his work. <clears throat> and he says... In verse 9, I will turn unto you. Verse 10, I will multiply men upon you and all the house of Israel. Verse 11, I will multiply upon you man and beast. I will settle you in verse 11. And I will do better unto you in verse 11. Verse 12, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel. They shall possess thee. They're going to walk over you and carry you into captivity. Neither will I cause men, verse 15, uh, to hear in thee the shame of the heathen anymore. I scattered them among the heathen, in verse 19. Then he says in verse 23, I'm going to start cleaning you up. I will sanctify my great name. I shall be sanctified among you, in verse 23. For I will take you from among the heathen, in verse 24. 
Now, here in verse 23 and 24, he's talking about bringing them back. All the chapters before this is talking about destroying Israel. And now he's talking about bringing them back. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries of the world. And will bring you into your own land. 1948, they became a nation. Israel began to come from all over the world. It's, it was really understood, commonly understood that Russian Jews were coming back to Israel by the hundreds of thousands because when Israel was scattered by the Assyrian Empire, that's these, here's, this is Georgia up here, and this is, was Russia up here, and they ended up up here in what's called Russia, and you had Jews all over Russia. And he said, I will bring you back. That's what he's saying right here. I, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you Clean water, that's living water, isn't it? That's pure water in Hebrews 10.22. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness. That's the Holy Spirit. From all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you. And I'll sprinkle that heart. And that's the spiritual Israel, isn't it? Israel has always been spiritual. And a new spirit will I put within you. Isn't that riding up on fleshy tables of our hearts? And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. You can't give your heart to Jesus. It reminds me of the 15th chapter of Matthew. What does God want with this heart in the 15th chapter of Matthew? Let me ask you this. 15th chapter of Matthew... Verse 19, for out of the heart... Now, when people say, just give your heart to Jesus, what does he want with this kind of a heart? For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands doesn't defile a man. He's saying, well, now what does God want with a heart that's full of adulteries and fornications and murders? Don't give your heart to Jesus. If he doesn't come by his action and right upon fleshy tables of the heart, this is the seal of God. It's always been upon the elect. It's not something he does only in the future, is it? And you see that man with the ink horn marking these people in Israel that he's not going to destroy. It doesn't mean at the end of time that some of us will not die the death over here at the end of time. It's talking about they didn't die the literal death. We won't die the spiritual death in eternity. We'll live forever. That's what he's talking Those that have the seal of God in their hearts. Now, and all through here he says, I will. I will put my spirit in you in verse 27. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. I will be your God in verse 28. Notice he's calling them. This is a calling back. When you get to the 37th chapter, he says he's going to bring Israel alive. And that's going to be spiritual, not literal. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. In verse 29, I will multiply the fruit of the tree. Whose will is it? And where's the action proceeding from? From God, not from man. I'm not going to do this for all the world, just for my Israel. Then shall you remember your own evil ways. Verse 33, I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities. I will also cause you to dwell in the cities. They shall say in verse 35, I will do it. I have spoken it. I will do it in verse 36. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel. To do it for them, I will increase them with men like a flock. They shall know that I am the Lord in verse 38. Now, let's go back over here. We see that man with the ink horn marking these people in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. Let's go back over here to, 
And let's look at the seal of God. It's the same thing wherever you find it in Scripture. It's not something that happens during the tribulation period. God has marked His people, hasn't He? Now look over here in Revelation 6. Do we have some time, Mike? Okay, look here in Revelation 6. We see Jesus with a little book in his hand. A sealed book with seven seals in verse, chapter 5, verse 1. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. With the signature of God, the sphragis of God. And then over here in chapter 6, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. The seal, remember, was an official stamp, government stamp, that just nobody could open it up. Open up a Roman book and you, they'll take you before you're in a court and they'll execute you. They'll cut your head off. You violate Roman law. Only the person that's worthy to open it could open it. If you, if you notice... Prior to this, we see verse 11 of chapter 4, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for all Thy pleasure they are and were created. And I saw in the right hand of Him that sat on the throne, chapter 5, verse 1, a book written on the, or a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy, who is worthy to open this Sealed book. And to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was worthy to open and to read the sealed book, neither to look thereon, because it was sealed by God. The only one that can reveal this book to his people is Jesus, right? So when you go into chapter 6, I saw the Lamb, which is Christ, open one of the seals. And he opens the seal, and we see a white horse coming, and that's the beast world system coming. And then we see he opens the second seal. I heard the second beast say, come and see. And then this man comes out on a red, ho red horse with a sword, and then the third seal is opened. The third, third signature, and only Jesus can open it. Heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld a black horse, and he that sat on him had balances in his hand, saying a measure of wheat for a penny and a measure of barley. Three measures of barley for a penny. Barley was the poor man's food. Wheat was the rich man's food. One measure could feed a man for a day. A penny was a day's wages. This is showing famine. That's what it's showing. Heard a voice of the, I've heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, and these four beasts are the face of the lion, the face of the, the eagle, the face of an ox, and the face of a man. These are the same four cherubim around the throne of God that we spoke about. These are the four that God forms a covenant with in the ninth chapter of Genesis. With the fowl of the air, beast of the field, with the cattle of the field, and with man when he comes out of the ark. It's nothing but... When you see the four judgments of God, it's confirmation of God's covenant with His people is all it is. And so you see that the fourth beast, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And look, behold, a pale horse in his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. Power was given him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with beast of the earth. And this would be famine. Or this would be pestilence, wouldn't it? When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them were slain for the word of God, for the testimony, the martyria which they held. And those of us, under the fourth seal, is going to reveal those people who have testified and witnessed for the Lord. Then, let's look over here in the, in the sixth, in the, uh, did I read verse seven? Read seven, yes. All right. <clears throat> look over here in chapter six. After these things I saw the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind 
should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Put it in their minds, in their hearts. I'm going to put it in their minds. This would be a panoramic picture of all time. Did God seal Adam? Well, yeah. Did he seal Noah? Did he seal Shem? Did he seal all his descendants down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? Did he seal Jacob, Israel? Did he seal his four people, his twelve people? Yes. Did he seal all these? And then when he blinded them, did he seal all of his New Testament Israel, New Testament church? How did he seal us? He wrote it on fleshy tables of our hearts. He shed abroad his love in our hearts. He wrote it in our minds, in our conscience. This is the seal of God. It's not taking the mark of the beast during a seven-year tribulation or the last three and a half years, and they come around, throw you on the ground. You say, I don't want to believe. Well, you're going to anyway. <laughs> That's dumb, isn't it? But I don't want to take the mark of the beast. You put it over my forehead, and I have to go to hell. And I believe God. I believe predestination. I didn't want to go to hell. We gave it to you anyway. It's just, it's dumb theology, isn't it? Stupid theology. Now, Look over here in Revelation 6 and look at verse 5. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Reuben. Were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Gad, sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Asher, sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Naphtali, sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Manasseh, sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi, what? What? Tribe of Levi? What's he doing in there? Levi is never numbered with the 12 tribes of Israel. Never. And if you're going to notice, Dan is not in here. This is an improper numbering for literal Israel. Absolutely is improper. Dan always had a part in Israel. Always. But we went through this and we saw some improper numberings in the Old Testament. And we went through that as to what they were for. And I'm not going to go into that tonight. <clears throat> now why he left Dan out, the only thing I can conclude is that it's an improper numbering. When he gets to Levi, look at Numbers. Numbers, the first chapter. I started to give you this. Numbers, the first chapter. Speaking of Israel. And he numbers all the tribes. In fact, if you start up here, The firstborn, verse 20, chapter 1, of the children of Reuben, Israel's eldest son, 20 years old and upward, all those that go to war, he numbers them, tells you how many there are. Uh, Reuben were 40 and 6,500, 46,500 of the children of Simeon, uh, 22, and he gives you the number of them, uh, 59,300 of the children of Gad, 40 and 5,000 in verse 25 and 650 of the children of Judah. He numbers how many are leaving the mountain of God as they're leaving. Uh, this is at the end of the Sinai discourse of the children of Issachar. He numbers them in verse 29, 54,400 of the children of Zebulun, verse 30. Uh, he goes through that, 57,400 of the children of Joseph, namely the children of Ephraim. Uh, and he gives you the number there in verse 33, 40,500. 40, and of the children of Manasseh, he tells you how many is in there in verse 35, 32,200 of the children of Benjamin. 
35,400 of the children of Dan in verse 38, verse 39, uh, three score and 2,700 of the children of Asher in verse 40. He tells you in 40 and 1,500 of the children of Naphtali in verse 42. He tells you that's 50 and 3,400. These are those that were numbered, which Moses and Aaron numbered, and the and the princes of Israel being twelve men, each one was for the house of his fathers. So were all those that were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers from twenty years old and upward. And all they were able to go forth into the war in Israel. Even all they that were numbered were six hundred thousand and three thousand and five hundred and fifty. But the Levites after the tribe of their fathers were not numbered with them. Why? They didn't have any land. They had no inheritance. God says you don't have any inheritance. There in Numbers the 8th chapter. I'm going to give you the tithe instead of a track of land. And you will be all over Israel because you're priests of Israel. You're not numbered. Where's the 12th tribe going to come from? Joseph's tribe was split in two between Ephraim and Manasseh. Right? There were actually 13 tribes in Israel. There were actually 13 apostles. Paul says, I was an apostle, one born out of due time. He didn't follow Jesus, but he was an apostle. Take that. Do that what you want to. <laughs> Levi was not numbered, and when you look at Numbers 26, you can, go, you can stop at Numbers 8 on the way, but I don't have time. Numbers 26. Numbers 26 and verse 62. 26 and 62. And you can go to the 18th chapter of this book. You can find they weren't numbered. 26. 62. These were the numbered of those that were 20,000 and all males from month old and upward for they were not numbered among the children of Israel. And it's speaking about Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, the high priest of Israel. And they were not numbered among the children of Israel because there was no inheritance given unto them among the children of Israel. And there's dozens of verses in Leviticus and Numbers that they weren't numbered. What in the world are doing numbered over here in, in the seventh chapter and having the seal of God? It's an improper numbering. 12,000 out of each tribe is 144,000, isn't it? And what are the 144,000? Those that are redeemed from the earth, those that follow the Lamb, akulatheo, A-K-O-U-L-O-T-H-E-L, lutheo. Akulatheo means to be in the same way with, and the way is narrow. These being the first fruits. James 1.18. We, we are... Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we would be the first fruits of God. That's a figurative term for Israel. Spiritual Israel, the church. So you've got not 12,000 out of each literal tribe of Israel. This is very figurative language. You've got Dan not numbered. You've got Levi numbered and that's wrong. The Bible's not wrong, but it's wrong to call this literal Israel, isn't it? It can't be. Levi was never numbered. Now, look here in, let me see, 9, 9, let's read verse 9. After this I beheld in a little great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne... What's the throne of God? Our hearts. It's the Ark of the Covenant. Before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, unto the Lamb, and all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. 
blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, that's all these 12,000, isn't it? Out of each tribe. 12 being a number, it's a figurative number of God's Israel. 12 times 12 is 144,000. When you go to the 14th chapter, the Bible says 144,000 are the first fruits. James 1.18 says, We are the first fruits of the church. These are they which came out of great tribulation, have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of Christ. The 144,000, or the 12,000 of each tribe, are those who have been washed in the blood. Right? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul? What does that mean? Our hearts are sprinkled? Written on fleshy tables of our hearts? Not on tables of stone any longer? So when you find these are those whose robes have been made white in the blood of Christ, that's the same thing as the mark, isn't it? Or the seal, isn't it? We're sealed by God. Then when you go to chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about space of half an hour. I don't have time to even go into that. That's <coughs> takes me too long. Because it goes with verse 3, the altar of incense. The priest went in to offer the incense. And there was about 30 minutes. And if he came out with those bells ringing, everything's okay. And if he didn't come out after about an hour, God struck him dead. And that's all I've got to say to that because I can't really go into it. And then chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 4. And it was commanded them, are these locusts, which were like scorpions. A locust was a false teacher. A locust ate up the literal bread crop. A scorpion was a false teacher. The Lord told Ezekiel, the second chapter, you dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words. Scorpion's a false teacher. The verb form is scorpizo. And that's the word Jesus used when he said the hireling cares not for the sheep. He allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock. Scatter is the verb form of scorpion. And the word Gentile, goyim, in the Hebrew means a flight of locusts. I don't have time to even explain all this. And they're not going to hurt the grass. They're, these scorpions, which are false teachers, are going to hurt the unbelievers. And then when you look at 10 and 4, 10 and 4. Now, I, don't, you know, I know some people don't like me repeating this word sealed, but do you realize how much you have to teach, to teach the sealed? When I go through the book of Revelation, I teach all these in great detail. I don't believe in teaching something in slight detail. I believe in teaching it over and over and over because it's repeated all through the book. 9 and 4. Or, yeah, 9. No, I gave you that. Ten and four. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And now would you like to know what the seven thunders uttered? Ask God when you get to heaven, because I don't know. I don't think nobody knows. If, if he didn't write them down, how are we going to know? Huh? And 20 and 3, 20 and 3, 20 and 3. Well, I saw an angel, verse 1, come down from heaven, have a, having a key of the place of no knowledge. It should say that. Abusas. Don't have time to the, explain that because the because the scorpions come out of the place of no knowledge and the beast comes out of the place of no knowledge. The beast comes out of the bottomless pit in the 11th chapter and the scorpions come out of the bottomless pit in the 9th chapter and it's the word abusas. It means a place of no knowledge. And great chain in his hand. He laid hold upon the dragon, that old serpent, which was the devil and Satan, and bound him for thousands years, more than 1,000, 2,000 at least. 
bound dio means to forbid and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations and the signature of God is upon him so that he cannot, it's a mark of God on him and going to forbid him from deceiving a group of nations. Nation is the word ethnos. It means non-Jews or Gentiles. There's going to be a group of Gentiles for a 2,000 year period that can't be deceived by Satan. That's the church. Isn't it? That word nations, ethnos, means non-Jews. Until the, And there's a seal set upon him. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that he must be loosed a little season. I go into that in tremendous detail. 22 and 10. 22 and 10. He saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Open the book to God's people. We've been sealed. The book is open to us. It's not open to the world. They, hi, they have eyes that they can't see and ears they can't hear. I don't know how in the world I got off in this. And do you know how much I've got to say on each one of these verses? Tons of people say, you repeat yourself. Don't be ridiculous. God repeats himself over and 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 over. If you just read through Ezekiel... It'll tell you one chapter or another. You've rebelled against God. You've, you've turned away from God. You've gone, after, you've gone after your gods. You've gone after your lovers. You've, gone, you've done this. You've offered to Baal in the grove. And, and I'm going to scatter you. And I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to send the famine. I'm going to send the pestilence. I'm going to send the sword. Repent. I know you can't repent. Don't pray for these people, Ezekiel. Don't pray for these people, Jeremiah. And preach to them over and over and over and over and over. The same message over and over. Till I destroy them. How long do you think God preached to Israel? 500 years while they were going after Baal in the grove and Shemosh and Molech. And by the way, it's the same system as brought in the church and renamed Christ's Mass. I'm absolutely positive that. I'll lay down my life for that. Preachers say, well, I just don't think that's what it means. I'll die for it, will you? I'm out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Help us to see these things. Lord, to... Get a hold of how you have so intricately designed your word to mesh together and synthesize all of these synonymous ways of saying things. Lord, it's helped the people to learn to examine as they read. God will praise you for everything, glorify you. Thank you for truth. Lord, I pray you'll give me a continual method of saying these things to the folks here. Open up this scripture to us that we can see the magnificence of your word. Lead us to your elect. Give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. I didn't mean to go there, but I did. <clears throat> At least maybe you can see the seals the signature.